Honorable members, I shall now propose the question for debate. The question is that a bill entitled An Act to Provide for the Service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending on the 30th day of September 2022 be now read a second time. Leader of the Opposition. Three hours and 38 minutes speaking time. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in public life, you know, we end up giving speeches at many events. And um, I'm reminded now of one of my most favorite introductions when I went to give a speech. When I was Minister of Education, we would go to school graduations and um, make speeches. One year I went to a school in Separia and the teachers decided they would not have an adult introduce me. They will ask one of the students. So a young boy comes up, about 11 year old, 11 plus, he had just written the SEE. He comes to the microphone and he says, my job here is very simple. All I have to do is introduce Kamla. So I am not going to make any long, boring speech, but I will now introduce you to the person who will, Kamla Prasad Misasa. I trust, Madam, today, it is not my intention to make any long, boring speech, but I think this is a very important debate and I thank you for the opportunity to contribute. I have sat in this esteemed house for almost 27 years. Over 25 of those years were at the behest of the great constituents of Separia, whose ongoing vote of confidence in me is something I will always cherish. During those years, when I contributed to the national budget, I did so as a senator, I did so as an MP, I did so as a minister, I did so as a prime minister, and I did so also, and I'm doing today as opposition leader. And during all those years, I've always been cognizant that I speak for and on behalf of all the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Not just my beloved constituents, not just the UNC supporters, not just the over 309,000 persons who voted for a great UNC party last year in the elections, but for every single citizen of this country, this great country, because that is the role of, of, of persons as us, as our members of parliament in this esteemed house. We are duty bound to make legislation and policies which seek to protect and serve the interests, the rights, the welfare, the very lives and livelihoods of our citizens. You see, Madam Speaker, they are our employers. We are elected to serve them, and failure to do so in any and every possible way is nothing short of a dereliction of duty. I rise today to fulfill the sacred duty as an MP and as the opposition leader of Trinidad and Tobago to speak on behalf of citizens of our very beloved country. I have to say with the heaviest of hearts that government has shirked in its duty. They have violated the very principles of membership in this esteemed house. They have used their razor-thin parliamentary majority to consistently abuse the spirit and intent of our sacred constitution. They have effectively de declared war on the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, especially in the last year. You see, you see, madam, when a government uses its bearers of majorities to pass bad laws aimed at subverting our constitutional rights, 
in every possible way that is waging war against our own citizens. When at the beginning of a global pandemic, despite the opposition pleas and warnings, a government chooses to ignore the health and safety of its own citizens for the sake of who knows what, and then desperately engages in treacherous, misleading propaganda to fool citizens such as dangerous disinformation, that is a war against the people. When that same government then disingenuously attempts to hide crucial health statistics regarding the pandemic, even as the country sees an alarming, buffing increase in COVID-related deaths, and when that same government fools the people into thinking it is safe to go to Tobago for Easter, or that it is safe to line up in your thousands in the rain for COVID vaccines that were never available then in the first place, that too is war against our citizens. When the government then proceeds to lock down a country, and restrict citizens from doing anything and everything, imposing useless curfews and other willy-nilly chaotic half wit policies because of his hapless, useless Minister of Health, who is clueless, incompetent, and a failure. That too is war on the population. When a government shamelessly blames citizens for its own woeful mismanagement of the pandemic, and then threatens to keep citizens in a permanent state of lockdown, deliberately engendering joblessness, hunger, economic health, and social destruction, simply because the government just cannot do anything right. That too is war against our citizens. When a government openly promotes discrimination amongst the population by engaging in hate mongering and divisiveness between vaccinated and unvaccinated citizens, when it robs the nation's children of their right to an education, when it viciously bullies, defames, and seeks to destroy every citizen who dares to speak out against their failures, against their incompetence, and their tyranny, that is also war against the country. When a government engages in overt privatization of democracy and seeks to destroy, taint, and bring into public odium and ridicule, every single independent office in our land, including the Independent Police Service Commission, even whilst crime and criminality is, is increasing, I say that is also war against the people. When a government comes to Parliament at the country's lowest point in our history, economically, socially, and otherwise, and presents a budget that is nothing short of an exercise in false promises, gaslighting, and pure nonsensical pronouncements, a budget aimed at pulling wool over the eyes of a desperate population, a budget that is an exercise in ongoing conmanship, that too is a war against the people. Further, when that government shadily takes over 100 million of taxpayers' dollars to pay off its well-oiled friends, but in its shameless conjure budget, chooses to tell a starving, desperate, pauperized citizenry who are forced to choose between feeding their children or paying rent. They say, let them eat biscuit and pigtail. That is the worst kind of war against the population. Madam, I'm here today to say, like I've been doing since 1994, I stand in this honorable house. I will do so inside this house and outside of this house. I will meet with anyone on the pavement. And I will fight for the people of our country with all the legal and parliamentary powers that are afforded to me by our constitution and in accordance with my conscience and my humanity. And so too will my members of the team. Today, today my presentation is titled Rescuing, Rebuilding, and Restoring Trinidad and Tobago a government at war with its own citizens, it is a time to take back our country from tyrants. I rise in defense of the people of Trinidad and Tobago against the vicious attacks on them by this brutal and heartless, rowley-led government 
coming to us masking this as the budget 2022. I intend to be opposite to the minister who was long on rhetoric but short on substance. I intend to unmask them and demonstrate how they have once again failed the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I pause to say thanks to the members of my team, including our UNC MPs and senators, the UNC's national executive, UNC's local government practitioners, my staff at the opposition leader's office and the superior constituency. I say thank you also to the many persons from the business community, NGOs, CBOs, FBOs, and the general public for sharing their views and concerns with us. I reassure our citizens that we in opposition hear you. We will continue to listen and then lead. We will continue to be your voices in this parliament and outside of this parliament. I turn now, Madam, to, to, do, uh, to look at some of the failures of this government and of this Minister of Finance. The Minister of Finance has an unparalleled record of failure. He clearly doesn't have the stature, knowledge, competence, or expertise. We predicted, we predicted, we expected him to come with, in Dahlia, the same litany of lame excuses to justify his failures. The same overblown self-congratulations for doing the very minimum of what he's required to do. The same pie-in-the-sky schemes which will, given his record, end up in the same dustbin of his previous failed ideas. The same broken promises, PNM promises never materialize. I'll just name a few, there are numerous uh, ones here, and I'll just name a few. The National Statistical Institute, Institute promised since 2016, and we see it again repeating itself here in 2022. Special Economic Zones, promised since 2017, repeat again in 2022. Construction promised, point 14 highway, you know what since when? Since 1962, the BNM has been promising the point 14 highway. We started it, they stopped it, and back again in this year's uh, budget statement. Broadband services, free Wi-Fi, promised since 2015 and now again repeated here in 2022. I remember hearing the minister in a previous incarnation budget statement talking about free Wi-Fi in buses. Which bus has a free Wi-Fi in it? Repeat, repeat promises, nothing delivered. Agriculture stimulus package in 2018, again here now in 2022. Public utilities, since 2015, repeating about improving water supply and people still suffering to get water. In my own constituency, I see it and elsewhere. Manufacturing, repeat, repeat, improving the ease of doing business index, promised since 2018 and again back here in 2022. ICT education plan, promised since 2017, not delivered. And in this regard, we expected this and more. And we were not disappointed. He did not disappoint in this regard. Amongst the substance missing from this budget, as it has been for the last six years, is hope, vision, and a plan for the future. For the seventh time, this rowley led government has presented a budget bankrupt of ideas and policies to generate economic growth and to create jobs. There are no plans to help families all over Trinidad and Tobago currently struggling to make ends meet, struggling to survive, and to recover from the effects of six years of a failed, rowley-led government. <laughs> Apart from the predict predictable emptiness of the minister's statement, there was an added element that is truly alarming, madam. They did not identify a single new revenue stream, even whilst acknowledging that our revenues have been declining, not a single new revenue stream. And on top of that, not a single plan to create one new job. Not a plan. In 59 years as an independent nation, this is the first time a government has presented a budget statement without giving the expenditure, without accounting for its expenditure in the previous fiscal year, without telling us about its revenue, without telling us about expenditure in last fiscal year, which is, is coming to an end. And nothing about the deficit, nothing. And we know why, they didn't want us to hear it, to find it. These are the basic elements of a budget statement. And so, 
deficit, I'll share with you in a moment what that is at the end of this fiscal. This government has attacked everyone who calls out their untruths. The economists, the rating agencies even, journalists and many others. You don't just say a word, they, 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 they attack you, they call you out when we call them out. Now it seems the government is attacking mathematics itself. Because for them, mathematics is our anti pnm as well. As I said on Monday, in this budget, this con man's budget, the maths not matzen. The maths not matzen. The numbers, the numbers just do not add up. And with all of this, there is zero accountability. When, what the minister presented, some would say, madam, maybe not I, but some would say, it is not a national budget. Let's call it what it truly is, is a PNM hustle. A hustle. After six years of Swanavania, after six years of billions of taxpayers' monies being gifted to PNM friends, family, and financiers, after six years of draining our foreign reserves, after six years of maxing out the nation's credit card, running up billions in debt, after plundering all they could from the state, they have now turned their guns directly onto innocent citizens. With this weaponized budget statement, the rowley led government has declared war on the middle class, they have declared war on the working class, and they have declared war on the most vulnerable in our country. I want to remind you that something very revealing was said by the Honorable Prime Minister shortly after the 2020 election, when this Prime Minister was asked how he intended to bridge the gap between the rich and the poor. Do you know what he said? Do you remember? He said, I'm not really trying to interfere with the bridge between the rich and the poor, because there is nothing wrong with the rich getting richer. Imagine this is our Prime Minister. Meanwhile, most of the population struggling with job losses, high food prices, rising rents, mortgages, and so on. And the minister spoke about resilience, resilience in the face of the pandemic. But the only ones who are resilient are the ones who are the PNM's friends, family, and financiers. They are surviving. That is the PNM's mantra. You have to wonder if the cabinet is not being used to conduct, not, is not being used to conduct the affairs of people or instead is being used to conduct business deals, man. We have to wonder. Whenever a minister runs out of the cabinet, a new deal goes down. A new deal goes down. And this, this song that they sing, this chorus, COVID crashed the economy. The PNM crashed our economy. It was not COVID. The economy crashed long before COVID. You know, there's a saying, facts are stubborn things, and they do not go away. It is a rowdy led government, not COVID, which has put our economy into the ICU. Let us examine the vital signs of the health of an economy, and we'll demonstrate how sick we really are. These include collapsing GDP, unprecedented unemployment, dangerous debt, fallen credit ratings, depleted foreign reserves, negative foreign direct investment, and of course, all the various rates on the HSF. Let's look at decline in GDP first. This is a critical and common measure of the health of an economy, the GDP, gross domestic project, product. According to the government's own figures, the country was producing $60, $16 billion less in goods and services in 2019 than it, did when, um, than, it did, than it was producing when we were in office in 2015. This was a worst contraction in more than three decades, and this was before COVID, before COVID. GDP, by 2020, the GDP declined from 2015 worse than by 27.7 billion. GDP, GDP per capita, when my government left office in 2015, was over $126,000. Today, under this incompetent government, GDP per capita has fallen to $104,000. And here's a stubborn fact. Every citizen of Trinidad and Tobago was $21,452 richer under the government I led than they are today. COVID did not make our citizens poorer. The Rowley-led government did so. 
I turn now to rise in joblessness. And I say again, the maths, not maths. The ability to create jobs is another fundamental indicator of an economy's health. Currently, this government has not even bothered to collect data on the current state of joblessness. That alone should be a glaring indication that they have no concern about getting people back out to work. The government continues to stifle the CSO, to hide data, because every single indicator points to a sick and ailing economy. Imagine a review of the economy. They actually printed these words, and I quote, and that's um, this year, for this year, review of the economy. Unemployment data for 2021 is unavailable. However, information on retrenchment notices and other indicators monitored by the Central Bank of TNT suggests that the labor market conditions remain constrained in 2021. What indicators have you been monitoring that you could make such a statement? They have admitted that no data is available, yet how do they expect to make data-driven decisions? In that 2020 National Insurance Board report, which was only laid after we threatened to take the minister to court because they were hiding that. That book tells you things about employment and so on. It's only when we sent the uh, letter, pre-action letter, uh, that the minister hurriedly laid it. That 2020 NIB report shows that more than 112,000 people have lost their jobs since they came into office up to 2020. Only up to 2020. And we know this figure does not take into account the full effects of the pandemic. So that for this year of 2021, that report will not provide the data. Since the outset, onset of the COVID um, pandemic, in the first quarter of 2020, in addition from the private sector, several businesses have sent home workers. Last month, the Confederation of Regional Business Chambers estimated that 6,000 businesses face a, a permanent closure. And yet again in this budget, lack in substance, no plan or response has been made by the government to deal with this. Under this government, more than 18% of the country's entire labor force have lost their jobs. One in every five workers is jobless under this government. Here is another stubborn fact. The government I led created about 56,000 new jobs. And not only did we do that, we raised the minimum wage. Not once. We raised the minimum wage twice. We took it from $9 to $12.50, and then from $12.50 to $15. More people had more money in their pockets. More people had more money in their pockets. So COVID isn't putting people out of work. It is a rowly led government putting people out of work. I look now at taxes, Madam, revenue. In the last six years, hardworking citizens across our nation have seen their already dwindling incomes decline further as this government demanded they hand over more of their money via various taxes, a plethora of taxes. And when I said we created $56,000 under my watch, we did so without introducing a single new tax, not one tax. Here we are, this government. They introduce VAT on essential food items, even as people are now lining up by the thousands for hampers. And then you call them greedy. You call them greedy. A tax on tires, even though across the country, there are more potholes than road. Someone told me the PNM is a pothole national movement. They are hell-bent on reintroducing the dreaded property tax, which in this pandemic time will be a poverty tax on the poor. While in the middle of this pandemic, people are struggling, as I say, to put food on the table for their families. They, they um, establish an online purchase tax of 7%, imposed on citizens to force them to buy from bulk suppliers, who impose markups on goods to secure supernormal profits, and some of them happen to be PM financiers as well. They also reduced the gas subsidy, forcing taxi drivers and struggling families to pay more for transport, and we all know the domino effect as this cost is passed. And you know, I see now um, Guyana, 
We used to be the paradise. We used to be the number one in the CARICOM and so on. Ghana is in there recently. They have reduced the cost of their fuel, in effect subsidizing it, whilst we are busy dismantling that regime that existed. Can anyone who lives in TNT today say they are getting value for money from this punishing regime of the Rowley government? There's a famous phrase, taxation without representation is tyranny. What this government is doing is terrorizing our population. Here is another stubborn fact. The government I led removed the VAT, as I say, on over 7,000 food items. And so they are now trying to catch up by using the model that we had of zero written matters. But then that's another issue when we get there. So get to the VAT now. As if the ability to earn a living wasn't hard enough. Citizens are being rocked by the sharp increase in the price of staples and, and food items. On removing VAT from certain food items, the minister suggested that the substantial food price increase was due to the effects of the pandemic, such as trade and shipping issues, which he said will work their way out. So now that their backs are against the wall, what do they do? They have now reversed their previous position and returned to the UNC program of zero routine, routine basic items. The government had a virtual meltdown. <laughs> the Minister of Finance had a virtual meltdown. The government in 2016, when the opposition tried to block them, they moved to put back VAT on all these items, these zero-rated items. The minister was scathing in his criticism then, decrying our VAT plan as a populist move to gain the support of the people. So what are you doing now? You let people suffer for all these years, and then you come and you want to drop items. So you say, you see curry lovers? Curry zero-rated. When, when they caught you, when they caught you, when you were caught out, your explanation was it was a typo. Well, some people feel this whole budget statement is a typo. There's nothing in it. Nothing in it. But when we did it, we were helping to put food on the table for many families. And I make no apologies for that, for zero rating, zero rating those, those items. After they reinstated VAT on thousands of these items, the minister now wants to come and portray himself as his savior by removing fat from biscuit and pigtail and whatever. I tell you, that's as bare faced as you can ever get. The minister appears to have forgotten, but allow me to remind the minister how he cast aspersions on the integrity of our local entrepreneurs when he said, the more items you have, I quote, the more items you have on the exempt list, Madam Speaker, the more opportunities there are for people to cheat, to mislabel, to typify items, in a different category, to put them in different classification, that is what they want us to do. I say again, COVID is not taxing us to death. It is a rowley led PNM. <laughs> Unsustainable debt levels. Any economist will tell you that economic growth is a foundation of a successful economy. In the past six years, this Minister of Finance has acted like a reckless teenager with a credit card. For the past six years, he has gone on a wild spending spree with no thought or clue on how to repay his spending, except how? Taking from the safety net uh, from the HSF and increasing borrowings. Indeed, this government increased the borrowing limit under the Development Loans Act by $10 billion in um, 20, July 2021. This increase places borrowing limits under three statutes at TT $145 billion. He increased also the limits. In their first months in office, this PNM government rushed in December 4, 2015, first months in office, December 2015, to increase borrowing limits by $50 billion up to $120 billion under the Development Loans Act, Exter External Loans Act and the Guarantee Loans Act. So every one of these, when they came in, rushed to increase the borrowing stream, mean, you could borrow more. Instead of creating economic growth, they continued borrowing at the expense of our future generations. This irresponsible government has run five consecutive years of massive budget deficits. 
since September 2015, totally in 61.7 billion cumulatively. Cumulatively. 7.9 billion in fiscal 2016, 13.5 billion in fiscal 17, 5.7 billion in fiscal 2018, 4 billion in fiscal 2019, 16.7 billion in fiscal 2020. And Madam Speaker, Minister did not disclose the deficit for the last fiscal year. I said it. That's the year we are ending now and we're supposed to be reporting on. That's what we do in a budget statement. And that, Madam Speaker, for fiscal 2020 to 2021 was $13.7 billion in deficit, in deficit. The minister is now projecting about 9 billion for the next, for this fiscal year upcoming. We will wait to see what happens there. So a whopping 16.7 billion. And according to figures provided by the minister in this recent year, $13.7 billion in deficit. This government has been so reckless that the most recent estimates reveal that the country's net public debt stands at $125 billion. $125 billion. This is from the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago. This is the highest ever in our history. Our debt to GDP ratio is over 84%. 84%. There is another stubborn fact then. Under the government I led, our debt to GDP ratio was a mere 47.2. That has now climbed under them to 84%, which is really very a slippery slope to be on. It's a risky place to be. This is exceedingly high uh, debt ratio. And you know, we were able to keep that debt ratio, 47.2%, because my government actually had a clear economic policy and competent people. Today, the debt to GDP ratio stands, as I say, whopping 84. Could the member, could the member with the offending device please leave the chamber and get it under control? Three hours. I spoke for half hour. Pick a paper, please. Thank you, madam. Thank you. So all this debt, that is the money you and your children will have to repay. You'll have to find it to repay it for this spending. They have been borrowing money to spree, and then our children must find that money to repay in the future. So again, another stubborn fact. COVID is not driving us to bankruptcy. It is a rowley led p and I turn now to credit ratings, another indicator to assess the health of our economy. A sovereign credit rating speaks to a nation's ability to repay its debt. So we have this massive debt buildup, and then the rating tells us, you know, are we able to pay? What's going to happen? This is very critical to attract foreign direct investment. Under this Rowley-led government, TNT has gone from being classified as a high investment grade country to one that cannot be trusted to repay debtors, to pay the creditors. Our credit rate is now so bad, I think that not even DSS would want to lend money to this government. I don't think so. In 2015, when they came into office, they inherited from my government a sovereign credit grade of A stable from Standard & Poor's, one of the highest investments grade a nation can get. By December 2015, Standard & Poor's announced an immediate drop in the country's credit rates. They just came in, in uh, the, the election in 2015, and by December, drop in our ratings to negative. That downward spiral has continued over the last six years to this day. Thanks to this government, S&P now rates us as B, B, B minus negative. This is like just one notch above junk, junk status. Just a notch above junk status, how risky that is. The minister came here talking about how many countries that are below us and whatever and whatever. Well, I have an atlas that I looked at, and I want, I'll show it to him, you know, and I'll ask him this. Show me one country in the whole world where there has been such a drastic credit rating slide taking place. Show me one. 
You took six years to undo over three decades of economic progress. TNT's ace of credit rating took us decades to climb. And from the time you came in, on a slide, downhill, downhill. This is where the minister has brought our country to. As if that is not bad enough, a negative outlook means a real and current possibility of a further downgrade in the near future. You remember one year when the minister didn't like the ratings? He said he'd go and hire another company name which was Fitch. Fitch. I wonder what Fitch had to say because I don't think the country ever found out. Maybe he could tell us what Fitch said. I say, madam, it will take a UNC government to rebuild and restore our credit rating. A report by the other ratings agency, Moody's, issued just over a month ago, highlighted that Trinidad and Tobago continues to massively underperform. In fact, Moody's went so far as to say that after six years of this rowley led government, the country's macroeconomic institutional capacity including fiscal and monetary policy frameworks, are weaker than most other peer countries. So when, you when you're comparing, Minister, you pair, compare apples with apples, grapes with grapes, oranges with oranges. You compare with your peer countries, and you don't pick out of a hat to justify that we're better than them, and they're worse off than us. Peer countries. In other words, the government is failing. I say again, stubborn fact. COVID didn't take our, our economy to junk status. It was a rowley led PNM. Foreign reserves crisis. Ever since this government took office, our net official reserves have been on the decline, falling from 10, US $10.459 billion when we left office fallen down now to 7.1 billion US dollars. Today, our net official reserves gives us 8.7 months import cover, but when we left office, it was at 11.9 months. Our import cover has not been in double digits since August 2017, almost four years ago. And under this government, it will never reach there. It will take a UNC government to restore and rebuild our import cover and our official reserves. And here's another stubborn fact, madam. The government I led recorded amongst the highest levels of FDI in our country, US $13.8 billion in 2014, which is about $96.7 billion TT dollars. Even with the IMF gifting this government over 600 million US dollars through special drawing rights, we still had more import co cover on the my watch than they have. So where has all this money gone? It only took this government about 94 recusals from the cabinet to make almost 4 billion US dollars disappear. Today, small and medium-sized businesses are struggling to get the forex they need to survive, while the friends, the family, the financiers um, continue to record profits. When small businesses email the Prime Minister begging for, for Forex, what does the Prime Minister turn around and say? What did he say? Kiss my hands. Kiss my hands. Banks have begun limiting credit card limits of U.S. purchases, while conglomerates friendly with the government get the dollars they want, the U.S. Again, COVID did not take away our Forex. It is this rowley led government through friends and family and financiers did. Who did? I talk now about foreign direct investment. <clears throat> the PNM government, and Madam, I'm going through all these indicators, macro indicators, because they are the signs, the vital signs for assessing the health of an economy. This government has been the most anti business in our history. Every day we are seeing businesses from cement makers to IT companies, and especially those in the energy sector, shutting up shop or shipping out elsewhere. Today, even Unipet is reported to be taking their money out to invest in Ghana. Investors are taking their money out of Trinidad and Tobago at an alarming rate because they have no confidence in this government and their half-baked economic plans. Under this government, our total net FDI from 2016 to 2020 is, guess what? Minus, madam, minus 11.7 
billion dollars. Negative, minus. This is almost $12 billion wide pothole in our road to recovery. And here's another stubborn fact. Under the government I led, Trinidad and Tobago attracted amongst the highest FDI into the country, 7.1 billion US, 48.3 billion TT dollars. The same government is responsible for our country losing almost TT $10 billion in foreign direct investment in just five years. So COVID is not chasing away the investors, you know. They've been chased away by the rowdy led government. I want to look now at our rainy day fund, our legacy fund, our sovereign, um, sovereign wealth fund, the HSF. When this government came into office in 2015, they could not wait to get it, their hands on our precious heritage and civilization fund. That fund is our legacy for the next generation. It is our rainy day fund, as I said. And yes, COVID brought some harsh downpours. But long before 2020, this government closed the umbrella on this nation, long before COVID. It is a matter of record. The last time the HSF had money put into it, it was under a government I led. We saved money in the HSF. This government was in power five years before COVID hit last year. They did not put one red cent or one black cent in the HSF, not one. Instead, they raided the rainy day fund. And by the way, you know, I heard the prime minister say recently that the HSF was created by the PNM. Let me tell the Prime Minister that the PNM did not create the HSF. The brightest economic policy the PNM ever had was to give away a free LED bulb, a light bulb. A light bulb. The Minister went into great detail on how the IMF works, but apparently he probably needs to let the Prime Minister know how the HSF works. The HSF was conceived and created under the Pandey government. <laughs> Indeed, every point of economic progress this country has ever experienced was done by a UNC government, dollar for dollar. Dollar for dollar, education for all. Water for all. Guess what? We were known as the box drain government. But you see, if you had kept out that program, all this flooding you're having all over the country may not have come to pass. But I see somewhere, somewhere, you know, I see somewhere in these, all these documents and reports, no talking about box drains, no talking about box drains. I'm saying the progress under the U UNC government. And when we, I said this uh, HSF, it was created under the Pandey government, and all the PNM did was to change the name of the fund. And you know what? It, it took them six years to change the name. Six years to change the name to HSF. It was the Interim Revenue Stabilization Fund created by the Pandey government in 2000. That is what became New name, HSF, in 2007. Here is another fact. No other government has withdrawn from the HSF other than this long-eyed government. No other government. No other government. In June 2016, they withdrew US 375 million. That is about 2.5 billion TT. There was no COVID then. In 2017, they took out 1.7 billion TT. There was no COVID then. In 2020, they took out 6.65 um, billion. No COVID then. And this is, I'm talking about billion and not million. Billion, billion, billion. As Arnold Roberts says, b -b 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 billions. Billions. That is over 225 million TT every month since they've been in office. In total, this government has gone into the HSF 12 times since coming into office. And they will keep going back. They will keep going back because they are like hustlers, you know, in some ways. They will keep going back 12 times. In this year alone, as I said, several times they've gone into the fund. Here is another stubborn fact, madam. 
It was a government I led that deposited US $1.18 billion. Billion dollars. That, that is the US, and on the TT side, $8 billion. $8 billion. $8 billion, $21 million we deposited in our term in office. Under my leadership, the HSF grew by 17.5 billion TT. Under this government, on the other hand, they have withdrawn TT 16.3 billion. 16.3, we deposited in that 17.5, they nearly take out all that we had left there and saved. 16.3 billion they took out. We grew the fund by 17 plus billion. And as I said already, they rated it by 16 plus billion. All the money we saved, they have spent. What do you have to show for it? Where has the money gone? Where have, has all this money gone? COVID is not raiding the HSF. It is a rowley led PNM that is doing that. I turn now, madam, to look at what I see as a frightening situation in our country. That is the erosion of independent institutions. The erosion of independent institutions. The minister spoke in his, in his statement, the minister spoke about strengthening institutions. When in fact this government has had a sustained assault on the independent institutions of our country. The minister mentioned the central bank in that category. But let us take a look at what is happening at the central bank. What have they done? They have installed a compliant and obedient governor, transforming the once robust central bank into a subdivision of the Ministry of Finance. They amended the Central Bank Act to allow the Minister of Finance to access confidential information on any employee at the bank. They reduced the term of the governor to ensure that he will be their puppet. This brazen act meant to intimidate and control the bank was widely condemned by every single former governor of the bank, with the exception of one Ewart Williams. I think he's the minister's advisor, if I'm not mistaken. He was the only one who stayed silent on this matter. The Citroen Central Bank governor, however, did what his masters told him, and he said nothing. Last week, I saw a newspaper editorial that said there needs to be transparency in our forex distribution. Well, when the previous bank governor disclosed the largest consumers of this country's forex, many of whom are again friends and financiers and family of the PNM government, they fired him, they fired him, fired him, persecuting him for years after. This is just one example of the way the government is assaulting our institutions. We see a similar assault on the independence of the EBC, on the Police Service Commission, the Office of the Procurement Regulator, they propose TTRA to really an assault on the independent BIR. What they are doing is breaking down institutions, which they are now claiming they want to protect and serve. I turn now to another institution the minister mentioned in his, um, in his statement, the TTRA, the Trinidad Tobago Revenue Authority. Minister boldly announced that the government will move towards the implementation of a TTRA. The government indicated that this is to ensure the efficient collection of taxes from citizens. The minister has spent millions to set up that TTRA to ensure that he can go into the pockets of citizens to collect taxes in this guava season, but he would not find sufficient money to help people. This bill came to the parliament many incarnations. In 2010, twice in 2018, once in 2019, all those versions of the bill to establish the TTRA contain a three-fifth special majority clause. Save and accept the 2021 TTRA bill, which is currently on the order paper of this House, which was passed in the Senate with a simple majority. The Attorney General and Cabinet have a passion for removing constitutional majority and railroading their way in an undemocratic, undemocratic manner through the Parliament. That TTRA bill interferes significantly with property rights and privacy rights protected by sections four and five of the Constitution, but no special majority clause. They removed it. It is my considered view that the bill, if passed without a special majority, it will come here 
is, if it's passed without us, it will be unconstitutional and we will challenge it in the courts. We will challenge it. This TTRA is in effect the Minister's Revenue Authority. There is no independence in the provisions that are laid out in the bill to the authority or the Board of Management. There is no independence because the Minister and our Cabinet has total control over the appointment of the Board, Director General and employees of the TTRA. The Minister announced that he would pick out, he get a hundred um, tax army, hundred persons. What happened to the last time you said you would bring out an army of tax collectors and tax, what, and tax compliance officers? What happened to them? Did, were they ever hired? Where is the independence of the CTRA? Minister Imbert has inserted himself in the entire TTRA, which is supposed to be an independent body such as it is with the BIR. We have seen when there is political interference in independent institutions, they crash. Just look at the police service. Look at the police service commission, which I turn to now. I am aware that there are several court actions regarding, firstly, the interpretation of the 2021 order in relation to the appointment and selection of a commissioner police. That has now been expanded to include an interpretation of the 2009 order, which deals with acting appointments. This was introduced by the AG, who apparently is now confessing that he needs the help of the court to read and understand the legislation that he drafted and brought here. There is also a court matter challenging certain decisions made by the now defunct Police Service Commission. Madam, I do not intend to speak on these matters as they pertain to the court proceedings. However, we cannot entirely ignore the elephant in the room. Our state of national insecurity is made even more glaring as a result of this debacle surrounding the appointment of a cop and the complete implosion of the Police Service Commission due to the reckless, incompetent, and deliberate political interference in our independent institutions and processes by high public officials. Based on what is reported in the media, Madam, we may very well find ourselves without a commissioner of police or even an acting com commissioner of police come October 15. That is when the appointment of the present acting Mr. Jacob ends. The Prime Minister and other members of the Cabinet have accepted that the proper procedure was not followed in the appointment of uh, one of the acting commissioners. This is the second time that this AG has attempted to inter interfere with the process of selecting and appointing a commissioner of police. And both times, litigation had to be commenced. The first time, they attempted to insert the Minister of National Security into the process, and the court struck it out, struck out those offending parts, saying that they were interfering with the independence of the Police Service Commission. <coughs> they have returned this year, and instead of inserting a minister into the process via the order, someone inserted themselves physically into the process by appearing in the President's house to exert influence. So they call upon the government, I call on the Prime Minister to tell us, who is that high official? Who is that official? Why is this relevant to the budget? Well, for one, the allocation to the TTPS has to be managed by the COP. He is the chief accounting officer. Without a COP or acting COP, who will be accountable for expenditure in this allocation? Whom? <clears throat> Additionally, the incompetence of the AG continues to cost taxpayers millions of dollars. Legal fees, legal opinions, and costs ordered by the court, all of which you, the taxpayer, must bear, and which could be avoided if we had a more competent attorney general. This money could have been better spent on resources for the TTPS to fight crime. We have witnessed an unprecedented constitutional crisis which demands absolute transparency. In this regard, I wish to state that I have written to Her Excellency the President a letter that has been signed by all 19 UNC MPs calling on Her Excellency to provide much needed answers to a series of questions when it comes to the Police Service Commission. Saddam.
Shut up. Just for a minute. I turn now to the Integrity Commission. In this budget, allocation is made for the Integrity Commission. We all know we are persons in public life, and as persons in public life, by law, we are compelled to declare assets to the Integrity Commission. Now, the Form B, um, we cannot see a, a person in public life. We can't see the, the Form A declaration, but we are allowed to examine the Form B at the Integrity Commission that any public person has filed. We learned recently of an individual who sold a Porsche SUV to their friends, but did not transfer it. That is apparently in breach of the law. Additionally, if such a person in public life fails to declare any sale of any assets, he is also in breach of the law. Based on the records in the Integrity Commission, a person in public life sold a vehicle, a Porsche, in 2016 and failed to disclose the sale to the Integrity Commission in 2017, in 2018, in 2019, in 2020. Failed in breach of the law, Madam Speaker. Only in 2021, after a mark bus, as people say, was the sale declared by way of a letter dated in February 2021. Why did it take five years to disclose the sale? Why? In breach of the law. What were you hiding? Is the Integrity Commission under-resourced to detect these matters? Government has slashed the recurrent expenditure to the Integrity Commission. Where, when we were there in 2015, it was 16.6 .6 million allocated. They've slashed it by half, by 50%, down to 8.3 million in this budget. 8.3 million. And so there we are. This matter, we deserve an explanation. Why you would take how many years? Five years or something? to comply with the Integrity in Public Law Act. I turn now to another matter that is cause for concern for everyone, and not just for UNC opposition members, or not just for trade unionists, not just for journalists, every person in public life. I want the government to answer if they have contracted an Israeli company to gather information and to intercept people's um, private phones and their emails and so on. A whistleblower has indicated that there are members of the government who has made contact with this Israeli company to intercept phones, emails, and other communications. Now, I raise this because it's not just opposition people in this matter. This is dangerous to our democracy. The PNM, in a previous incarnation, abused the national security apparatus. apparatus. To spy on private citizens and political opponents. And at that time, that PNM government, what, what they were spying on their, some of their own members, spying on some of their own members. That is why we came, when we went into government, when, we, when all those records came to us, we said, we came here and we changed the law, madam. But then when you put compliant persons, this is where you don't have the independence of office, then you go to them as your puppet and you tell them, do that, intercept these phones. And that's what's been happening with the breakdown of our independent institutions. This is dangerous, Madam Speaker. There may be even, I don't want to involve you in the debate, but in the last incarnation, even the president's phone was being hacked. The then president's phone was being hacked. I call on the Prime Minister, as head of National Security Council, to clear the air. Now, Madam, there was a report, there was a report some time ago in the middle of the lockdown when our borders were closed, that certain, uh, mem a number of Israeli persons had landed in Trinidad and Tobago. What they would, and that's in the lockdown, eh, when borders were closed and people couldn't come in. The Israelis landed here at the airport. And when we asked, what were they doing here? What did they come here to do? I'm still asking, is it true that they are still here? Is it true that they're not dealing with the, with the radar? And is it true that it might be dealing with all these illegal intercepts as well and hacking into people's private phones? I think the government must come clear on this matter. I turn now to the property tax. I dreaded property tax. The ministers included property tax under which section? Billing institutions. Since when property tax is an institution? 
Maybe the minister can enlighten me in his mind enough. I don't know if this is another typo. I don't know. But property tax, I saw it, I'm aware, is not an institution. According to the law, property tax collection can begin after 50% of all lands in TNT have been volumed. This means 50% of all residential, commercial, agricultural, Ma Madam industrial Speaker, lands. I beg your pardon, 53-1E, please. I'm hearing a lot of cross talk from across the floor. And, and the cross talk is on both sides. So I ask all members, let's listen to the, the member for Superior, leader of the opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So that means that 50% of all these lands um, have to be valued, would have been, have to be valued in order for the tax to be implemented. Today, the minister cannot tell us the total number of properties in TNT. Minister reported the 127,969 valuation return, return forms were submitted. So, well, Mr. Minister, does that take us to the 50% mark or doesn't it? How much is it of those uh, forms? And you are actually pursuing valuations in certain areas and constituencies so that the assessment role would be completed sooner in those areas and taxes collected there first. Is that what is happening? Is this geographic discrimination? Is this valuation apathy? These are concerns that citizens have. Will this tax be rolled out equitably? Persons today are struggling to keep a roof over their heads paying mortgage or rent for an apartment to live in. Some are being served eviction letters. They have no money to buy food and devices for their children, but the minister wants them to pay property tax or higher rents, which would come as a natural consequence of the property tax. Again, I say this is war on the people of Trinidad and Tobago at this time. Under this draconian law, if you fail to submit the valuation forms by 30th November, you shall be liable to pay a $5,000 fine. That is a criminal offense. So you can be dragged before a magistrate's court, you can be fined as $5,000 for failure to submit the form, and you will have a criminal record entered against you. All because this government wants your money. And they told us that, we want your money. Again, this is war on the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Further, Based on the law, a valuation tribunal should be established in the event someone objects to the evaluation. I ask the question, where is that tribunal? I have seen some say that the tax will benefit the community you live in. That is not true. That is not true. That is totally untrue, that it will benefit your community. In other countries, when property tax is collected by local government bodies, it goes towards fixing roads, drains, garbage collection, etc., etc., in your community. However, in TNT, all the property tax will go into the consolidated fund. This means it will go towards million dollar renters, million dollar indemnifications <laughs> in the pockets of family and friends of the recusal twins. It is heartless for the government to implement a new tax regime based on what a home could be rented for when most people cannot even pay rent in today's will in Trinidad. Many homes cannot be rented because of the state of the roads, the flooding, unreliable water supplies. I know there is at least one member of this government who should agree with me. I want to read a statement, madam, made in this house in 2009, and I quote, Presently in my constituency, there is anxiety at both ends of the spectrum. There is anger at both sides of the spectrum, and there is resentment on both sides. And I will tell you why. People are seeing this as a situation that ought not to have been, been um, that should not have been. If you accept my argument, or my understanding, that it is really a revenue-raising measure, and anything else is disingenuous, then people are saying, had we handled our largest differently, we probably would not have had to resort to this measure. That's the property tax, eh? in re reference to the property tax. The member who made that statement was none other than a member for Dago Martin West. None other. Mr. Prime Minister, through you, madam, I call upon you to heed your own words and stop the property tax now. 
heed your own words. The member rejected the claim that property taxes are revenue, you know. When we now have this Minister of Finance saying this will be a significant tax raising revenue measure. This Minister of Finance, significant tax raising revenue measure. With such strong views on this tax coming from the Prime Minister himself, it is obvious that the property tax is being collected now to compensate for all the bad spending and squandermania that has occurred. In 2009, when the country was better off economically than now, the member for Diego Martin West told the then government, and I quote, again, if you try to defend the indefensible, you will create resentment and provoke people, and that is what we have at the moment. I know a lot of people for whom $100 is a lot of money. A lot are struggling to make ends meet, end of quote, member for Diego Martin West. Again, I call upon the Prime Minister, do not be a hypocrite. And if you need man, order your Minister of Finance to stop the property tax now. <coughs> this is an area of the budget procurement, which was easily predictable. Every year since 2015, every year, Minister, like a broken record, will, re will repeat, Procurement Act will be fully proclaimed. It was repeated in 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, and again now in for 2022 budget. The law is languishing on the law books. When my government demitted office, we had introduced and passed this act, which aimed to increase integrity, transparency, and accountability. Then they came to amend that act and gutted the act. They took away the powers of the procurement regulator, stripped some of those powers, thereby creating possible corridors for corruption. They have managed to manipulate the procurement act to facilitate corruption. This is how they did it. This is how they did it. They removed, one, the procurement office from disposing selling property owned by the state. This means there will be no transparency with respect to the sale of any property owned by the state. Petrotrain, the port, anything else, all these hotel places you want to give them, there will be no transparency and integrity. Transparency. They gifted billion dollar state assets to friends and family and financiers. I'm asking. Some of the members of the cabinet can't even sell a Porsche properly, but they want to sell our national patrimony. They removed government-to-government -government transactions and public-private partnerships from scrutiny, and yet you're coming here to, to boast about more, um, the three Ps, as you call it, public-private partnerships, and engaging in these government uh, transactions, government-to-government. -government. How many public partnerships have we heard that the minister has announced in the hotel building and housing sector? Five hotels, five hotels. Where will be the transparency? <clears throat> they removed from legal scrutiny, financial scrutiny, auditing and accounting and medical services. So they remove legal fees, remember? Financial fees. Because somebody has a bank and so on, brokering, um, financial deals, they remove legal fields, they remove accounting, they remove medical services. I think somebody has some MRI place somewhere with medical services too. The removal of legal fees is particularly disconcerting given the recent shocking revelations concerning payment of legal fees. I call upon the Minister of Finance to revert to the original law which allowed for proper independent scrutiny of government contracts and disposal of sale of assets. <clears throat> it appears that this rowdy led government wants power without accountability or transparency. A UNC government will restore transparency and accountability and rebuild trust. Then we've seen the spectacle of the gutting of special majority legislation. I mentioned one, which was the TTRA. The government is no respecter of law, no man, especially if you're a normal, honorary man. 
Even the sacred duty of lawmaking is a puppy show for this government, an act of political malfeasance and sacrilege. This government is openly assaulting our democracy and violating our constitution. Every time they bring critical legislation to this parliament, affecting fundamental rights and freedoms, they take out the Trifus majority to pass laws in breach of enshrined fundamental rights. They have done it recently with the TTRA bill, as I said, up in the Senate. They did it with the Gambling, Gaming, and Betting and Control Act. They did it with the Evidence Amendment Act Number 1. They did it with the Procurement Amendment Act 2020. They did it with the Income Tax Amendment Act. And I can go on and on, the Interception of Communications Act, the Anti-Gang Amendment Act, gutting those out, taking out the special majority. And that special majority was placed there by our Constitution for fathers for a reason. It was placed there for a reason to provide enshrined protections for the fundamental rights of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. That's why it was there. So it's no simple thing because you want to pass a law and we'll go to court and challenge it if you want to go to court. And when you go to court, it will be struck down, I tell you. They embattled the AG in this cabinet. <coughs> Excuse me. Continue to use Surat to undermine citizens' rights and pass bad law. They make laws for their own profits. <coughs> now, Madam, there's another uh, very startling matter in the public domain. Sadly, our republic has had its experiences of political power being used to target pol political adversaries. History will demonstrate when incidents such as these arise, there are two factors. Such acts have always been perpetrated by the PNM and its agents, and they have always been aimed at undermining the rule of law and our democratic institutions. Though we may have come to expect this kind of behavior from the PNM, the latest revelations that are now in the public domain are unprecedented, troubling, and strikes at the very core of our democracy. As the leader of the opposition, Madam, I consider it my duty to raise these matters in the public interest. But I am mindful of the fact that these alarming revelations relate to matters before the court, and I will be most circumspect and balanced in my comments not to offend the sub judiciary rule. I will refer only to information in the public domain and ask questions of the government on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Whilst we are all preoccupied with the budget, we must not lose sight of events which impact our democracy and the rule of law. There can be no economic prosperity and development if we destroy the rule of law. <clears throat> On Monday last, in the aftermath of the tragedy they call a budget, I said that we would write international agencies and authorities on matters involving a foreign national. Today, I, I advise, I state that yesterday I sent off a letter I'd written to one Suella Braverman, QC, MP, Attorney General for England and Wales, with respect to a British citizen involved in a secret agreement with a high public official, and I have received an, 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 I have received an acknowledgement of this letter. I want to turn to another point, and this has to do with uh, what appears to be a government for friends, family, and finances. The minister themed his budget as resilience in the face of a pandemic. And as mentioned it before, while hundreds of thousands of people are suffering, there are those who have done quite well for themselves under this government, the friends, the family, and the finances. It would be remiss of me not to turn attention to perhaps one of the biggest jobs by the understation by someone who ironically is supposed to be the guardian of the public's interest. How could we forget the himself to himself arrangement taxpayers are paying for? Trinidad and Tobago has to be the only democratic country in the world 
where senior government minister can be a direct beneficiary of a government rental agreement. It seems like there is stiff competition in the PNM ramp camp for the position of Minister of Everything, because in this arrangement, the Attorney General, as a member of the government, is a tenant as well as a landlord. This is absolutely outrageous. <coughs> Can you imagine, while citizens of our country are lining up fighting to receive $1,500 income support, a thousand rent support, most of them are still waiting in despondence. The government of Trinidad and Tobago is comfortably paying in excess of, excess of 10 million in rent to the Attorney General's family. It is mind-boggling to believe that this is happening, and they have no problem with that. I don't know if they generally believe this is not a serious conflict of interest. They do not believe it is not unethical, or they know very well that this is wrong, but they'll do it anyway. Quite frankly, I don't know which is worse. Four billions, four billions. That's how many billions are being rented from the family of the Attorney General. That's a, at least that's a, a, how many we know about so Madam far, Speaker, Madam. Madam Speaker, I rise on a point of order, 53-1-E. The Attorney General and the Prime Minister's voices are disturbing us from hearing the Leader of Opposition. Member for Superior, please. Thank you, Madam. I say um, four buildings, Madam, that we know of are being rented um, from the family of the Attorney General, the relatives of the Attorney General. So, Madam, when you go to the Ministry of Public Utilities at one Alexandra place to complain about Wasser and how you never have water in your taps or that your street lights have not been working for months and TN Tech doesn't seem to bother by it, you should know that the government is paying $600,000 a month to relatives of the Attorney General. When you go to the personal department at 3 Alexandra Street to sort out your measly gratuity payment or your contract, <clears throat> you should know that the government is paying $575,000 per month in rent to a company of which the Attorney General is a director. When you go to the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services at 45A and C, 45A, 45C, St. Vincent Street, Port of Spain, and you cannot access government assistance, or you cannot get your salary relief grant of your 1500 or your rental support grant, you should know that the government is paying $159,000 per month to relatives of the Attorney General. And when you go to the TTPS at the corner of Agra Street in St. James, you cannot get your certificate of character to get a, to put with your job application. You call and they have no vehicles to respond to emergency. Or you don't feel safe in your communities because the TTPS is under resourced. You should know that the government is paying $356,000 per month to relatives of the Attorney General. But when you think that's as bad as it gets, from the landlord of the nation cometh the mother of all excuses. Excuses? I recuse myself. That has to be an insult to the intelligence of the people of this country. So far as we know, the AG recused himself no less than 37 times from the cabinet room. And then he goes out, dancing left foot to right foot, laughing all the way to the bank. Dancing left foot, right foot, all the way to the bank. It troubles none of them that this, this is happening. This is how they govern, left foot, right foot, from left hand to right hand, himself for himself. And the people must foot the bills at the end of the day. I turn to another area, ma'am, for concern. This has to do with the successor board to Petrogen, TPHL. Going against the advice of its own legal team, headed by senior counsel, this board filed no appeal. They filed no application to set aside the matter involved, the arbitration matter um, involving the Prime Minister's best friend for allegedly selling Petrotrin $100 million in fake oil. So the Prime Minister's best friend is very resilient. He's doing quite well. As fate would have it, that board is headed by the Prime Minister's personal lawyer. He's also resilient and doing very well. The thousands of ex petrofin workers and families who are now on the breadline are not resilient like that. 
as the best friend of the Prime Minister. I turn now, Madam, to shareholders of Alsin Resorts, <clears throat> which includes the Minister of Transport. They were lucky enough to see the land at the site of the former Kedona Drive-In sold for the construction of the Curup Interchange. That drive-in, any of you pass by there will know, has been closed for years. The property had been allowed to, you know, run down, been allowed to run down. Valsin Resorts, um, I read a report saying, filed a claim for $18 million from the state, which I'm sure will make their shareholders very resilient. They must certainly be more resilient than the thousands of persons who have lost their jobs and are still waiting on the promised salary relief grants. And we cannot leave this alone because we'll have to go and look at the young people as well. Can't forget that a relative of Minister Stuart Young, his name is Angus Young, is the CEO of NCB Global Finance, which used to be a very small debt collection company. But incredibly, under this government, NCB Global Finance has done deals with government to the tune of upwards of 2.5 billion taxpayer dollars, all in the space of five years, and 37 recusals by Minister Young. Recently, Global Finance even turned into a merchant bank. How resilient they have been. What an incredible achievement in a COVID pandemic, especially when you have at your aid a politician as a brother. I turn now to a matter that the Minister spent a lot of time on, which was the management of the COVID pandemic. And I say that that management was disastrous and continues so to be. The government came to use COVID to cover up their own failures. They even made a ludicrous claim that they acted swiftly and decisively to contain the pandemic. Nothing could be further from the truth. <clears throat> when the history of this pandemic is written, it will not be a story of how the government helped to save lives and livelihoods. It will be a sorry tale. <coughs> Excuse me, madam. When the history is written, it will be a sorry tale about how this government abused health regulations to stifle free speech both inside and outside of this parliament. It will be a story about how public health officials ignored warnings about a pandemic saying COVID-19 was unlikely to affect us. Right in a committee in this parliament. No, that's not going to come here, the CMOH. No, not going to come here. <clears throat> It will also be about how government officials ignore the pleas to address the pandemic. Then they bunger the vaccination drive, leaving the nation to suffer <clears throat> in chaos and confusion. Let's look at the issue of acting swiftly. Who can forget in January 2020, when we first tried to raise the looming threat of COVID, we were told that it was not urgent enough to warrant a debate. We then turned to the vaccine chaos. They place our entire nation in jeopardy because of their lazy schemes in procuring life-saving vaccines for our population. So while citizens were falling sick by the hundreds without vaccines, our Prime Minister said that he was too proud to beg for vaccines after his COVAX plan didn't come through. Let's not forget as well the botched rollout of max vaccination in June. The Minister of Health decided to scrap the appointment system and tell everybody, come, first come, first serve. No appointment, just turn up. From tomorrow, they can just walk in, get vaccinated and go back home. Easy. That was on Tuesday, June. The next day saw the chaos at the nation's health facilities. The Minister of Health put thousands of citizens' lives at risk because he wanted to show off. He wanted to boast. They started this big rollout. But what they were trying to cover up was that they had no vaccine. So people turned up in mass numbers and they had to turn them back. Added to that in the management, we have this propaganda press conference scene going on. This government never treated the pandemic as a public health emergency. For the past year, vital public health information has been dispensed via carefully staged, managed press conferences. Public health officials are made to stand next to the Prime Minister and repeat government talking points. Saturdays have now become the National Buffing Day, where the Prime Minister addresses the nation to berate and blame the population. Meanwhile, 
It's the Prime Minister who always had to go into quarantine all the time, either because he got COVID or he was in a primary contact with someone with COVID. But when ordinary citizens get COVID, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister berates them. When the Prime Minister be, himself gets the COVID, he still berates the citizens. I turn as well to the use of the state of emergency. In three months of the initial SOE, because of government's incompetence, our vaccine program was a mess. <clears throat> there was no slowdown in the number of cases. Then they came to extend the SOE, giving no data, no rational, no rhyme or reason for the extension. Now we have this gimmick of safe zones. After a year of attacking businesses and blaming everyone for wanting to make a living, government has now come with their latest gimmick, safe zones. Once again, the AG has presented another piece of legislation that is illogical, poorly conceived, and is bound to fail. These so-called TD safe zones are a conceptual disaster and will be a worse in practice. We shudder to think of the chaos that it will cause when implemented. We fear that businesses will fail to even generate enough income to cover operational costs. Functioning at 50% capacity out of a population pool of 42% vaccinated means that only 21% of the population is permitted to patronize these businesses at any point in time. I expect that these chambers and businesses currently supporting the safe zone policy will have to ask for help for it to be discontinued. The following must be considered. Listen, listen. You are saying that no one under the age of 12 will be allowed in a safe zone. And vaccinated people will be expected to show proof along with a form of ID. But children under 12 are not being vaccinated or may not be vaccinated. And if they are under 12, then what is a parent to do? What is a family to do? When you go to any one of these places, would you leave the children in the car? And therefore, to open family ent entertainment places like cinemas and water parks makes no sense if children under 12 cannot have access to them. <clears throat> Why? Because there's no proved vaccination for children under 12. This is a serious matter. What do you expect the parents to do? The obvious answer is that families with children under 12 will not use these safe zones, thus reducing the authorized pool of customers even further. Moreover, this safe zone policy is impractical for hotels. In Tobago, it eliminates any vaccine to operate, vaccinate to operate benefits, because once again, children under 12 will be denied access, because there's no vaccine and they will not be vaccinated. And then there's the issue of unvaccinated employees now have to produce a PCR test every two weeks to continue to work. Who pays for this? This contradicts the opinion of the president of the industrial court, Deborah Thomas Felix, that terms of employment cannot be arbitrarily changed by an employer. No one in government has answered this question. Clearly, these are unrealistic measures that foster neither health nor economic advantages. I view this safe zone policy as a gimmick. It's meant to help pad the minister's thin budget and his amounts of vaccine apathy. <clears throat> relief measures not reaching those in need. I talk about the salary relief grants now. The minister spent a lot of time, a lot of pages on these grants. I have found the more this minister speaks, the more it shows why our country is in crisis. Speaking about the salary relief grant, which falls under his portfolio, the minister boasted to this country that for 2020, a total of 86,924 grants valued at a total of 143.6 million have been paid. Well, I checked. I checked the yellow books. And let me tell you what I found. According to the estimates of expenditure, and for that year that the minister is talking about 2020, the actual expenditure for 2020 was not $143 million. So which is it? It was $42.6 million in the yellow books. $42.6 million in the yellow books. So which is it, minister? Is this another typo? Does this amount to another typo where you say one thing in the statement and then in the estimates it's different? 
But that is, and again, that's where I come back again, mats, not matson. But that's not the only thing. According to the Minister for 21, the fiscal year just completed, a total of 8,200 grants, valued at 24 million, have been paid out in salary relief grants. Again, according to the same books that you supplied with, Minister, us with, there was absolutely no allocation in 2021 for salary relief grant. So where did you get that money from? And how could you spend it without an allocation out of your ministry? So if you took from one head and put it under another within your ministry, it should still be reflected in the yellow book in the estimates under actual and revised expenditure for that year. So is this another typo? Is this another typo? Where did that 24 million come from? And can I say once more? Or can I say further? Do you all know, in those same estimates, no allocation has been made for the upcoming fiscal year 2022? None. None whatsoever for salary relief grants. I say again, in maths, not maths in. Every year, there's some kind of bacchanal with these salary relief grants. Madam, I turn to a very important sector, which is the national security sector. The, the minister spoke for three hours, you told me, and 30 something minutes. And during that time, his statement contained about 26,000 words. And in all of that 26,000 words, 164 pages, three hours plus, the minister used the word police once. Once. And that was only in reference to a police youth club distributing hampers. And this at a time when crime is escalating, crime and criminality escalating. The Minister paid scant regard for the safety and security of our citizens. Instead of giving us updates and progress reports from the Minister of Finance about national security, we heard a drab repeat of the same proposed measures of yesteryears. In some cases, the Minister was satisfied to merely copy and paste the wording of parts of his 2021 speech. And we all know you cannot expect to do or rather say the same things over and over and again and expect a different result. You'll end up with the same khaki pants, the same short khaki pants. Last year in the budget, Minister gleefully announced TTPS will be given money for the purchase of GPS for police vehicles. CCTV cameras, body cameras, and drones. But again, when you look at estimates, the truth is revealed. They allocated $7 million for mining equipment purchases, but the yellow books show they spent only $0.8 million of that allocation. So you come in the budget and you know it's big numbers, but then you don't spend it, you don't disburse it, and this is an area where it's needed, national security. So $7 million, they spent $0.8 million. Out of the total of seven million, the minister only released less than one million dollars, point eight. This year, we see another allocation for six million for mining equipment, and this may turn out to be another mama guy to, for the TTPS and to the country. You will hear them boast about purchasing vehicles for the police. Again, the estimates reveal the truth. Twenty-five million dollars were allocated in this last fiscal year. Do you know how much was released, madam? 4.1 million dollars. So why are you always consistently overestimating and underestimating? You're, you're, and then not giving the allocations, why? <clears throat> the minister this year has mentioned the integrated logistics support facility. That is something we heard last year, of course. And you know what is allocated for it? 1.4 million in the last budget, and guess what? Not a single spend cent of that was spent. Not a single cent. And many of the projects are like that, madam, I'll tell you. In all these sectors, our MPs on this side have shadow portfolios, and they will go into greater depth for each of the ministries and sectors. So they have no achievements. And therefore, what they're doing now, they're claiming to build things that they didn't build. They're claiming that they're going to build things that are already built. And I don't know how the opening of the penal fire station, you know, I was there. And the, then, and the then Minister Stuart Young, we opened it together. Um, he's no longer national security, but he then opened it in capacity as Minister of National Security, Penal Fire Station. And I don't know, um, <laughs> I don't know how the opening of that station 
um, slipped the memory of the member for Port of Prince North St. Anne's. Minister Young, I know it slipped his memory. And that was something I'll never forget. It was horrifying. And I don't know how they forgot that and put it back, put it in the budget as to be built. A similar thing is happening with the Roxborough Fire Station. Put back in this budget statement, they're going to build it. Do you think Bill already? Built already. Energy sector, madam. Energy sector. More typos, maybe. Yeah. My, I guess those are all typos. With the energy sector, what a sad thing we place we are with our energy sector. Once the energy sector was really our masterpiece, centerpiece, everything else you could think of in that regard. We had one of the oldest oil industries. I remember reading a, in a book, somebody writing up about Petrotrin Dong Day and the, the flame, uh, some great legacy. I remember that we supplied fuel, madam, during the World War II. It was our, our, our energy, ours. We were so great that we were shipping and helping in the war efforts in those days. And now here we are, and I think on last Monday, the minister read the eulogy of the energy sector. Six years of untruths, thank you. Six years of untruths, collapse, and crisis. When I listened to him, I noticed that unlike previous ministers of finance, he was not reporting on the success of our nation's strongest sector. Instead, what he did, as I said, he read the eulogy for the energy sector. First of all, we have to look at the unrealistic, misleading gas figure. Minister boasted gas production would increase to 3.37 billion standard cubic feet in the next year. Minister, you think that will really happen? The fact is that under your watch, gas production collapsed to its lowest in decades. Lowest in decades. To 2.7 billion standard cubic feet. And then we have the pie in the sky, oil production figure. The government has carried oil production to its lowest since 1950s. Since the 1950s. When we left office, oil production was around 80,000 barrels per day. In our last year, your last year, your last year, the rowley led government, you averaged 57,800 barrels per day. How can we expect for you to achieve 86,000 barrels next year when you have struggled to the last six years to even achieve over, over 70,000 barrels? How are you going to do it? More pie in the sky. For five years, the Prime Minister has beaten his chest that he's the nation's best salesman. How can you be the best salesman when our nation has gone from positive FDI flows, foreign direct investment flows, to negative, as I said before, Minus 11 point something. How can you be the best salesman? How can you be the best salesman when only last month Exxon announced that it is moving almost all supply work from Trinidad to Ghana? How can that be? How can you be the best salesman when you single-handedly destroyed Point Lisas with your Houston gas negotiations, causing the most planned closures ever in our nation's history, decimating the downstream sector? My, uh, my shadow, uh, a person shadowing energy will talk a little more, but I must say that the incentives we introduced in our term were innovative enough that they would have been able to attract and allow companies to exist in the economy of today, even though we'll be facing the competition from Ghana, facing competition from green energy, and facing pandemic shutdown. So we will give you more details of what we would have done. But clearly none of that is happening now. We're Company, the Exxon has de declared that it will leave. There are also pie in the sky lies, maybe I can't say lies, but untruths on about the failures on gas production. So I spoke about the oil production, gas production. In the 2019 budget, Minister, you told our nation that gas production would increase to 4.05 billion standard cubic feet per day in 2020, and 4.14 billion per day in 2021, due to incompetence that instead of increasing production, it fell, as I said before, to the lowest level in decades. When we left office, gas production would be 3.8 and 4 billion uh, standard cubic feet. 
Not once have you managed to surpass the level of gas production that the government I, I led did. You have spent years talking about the partnership's treatment of NGC, but today I remind this government that NGC never made a loss under my government. We see, we see NGC has recorded a loss. We see NGC has recorded a loss of $2.1 billion. That wasn't COVID. That was not the global economy. It was a poorly negotiated gas prices by this government. Still on the, uh, on the energy sector, we have seen the abuse of the N N NGC. This is we've, we've um, termed it Malcolm Jewell's 2.0. They criticize the partnership government for using NGC dividends to develop the lives of people of this nation. But once did we ever abuse NGC as we have been seeing in the last few months. In September, our nation was reminded of the usual everyday vulgar mismanagement by this government when it revealed that the board of NGC had allegedly sought indemnity for the decision to spend $440 million on the Atlantic trade one turnaround. What is really going on at NGC? How can a government and cabinet, which has boasted about value for money, allow this wastage of taxpayers' money at a time when we are struggling for revenue? Prime Minister, why are you protecting Mark Loquan? Why? And then we come to the biggest national betrayal, Petrotrin. This government must never be forgiven for putting out the light at Petrotrin. This government must never be forgiven for the dismay and despair they co caused through their betrayal of shutting down Petrotrin. Remember, the government is not closing down Petrotrin. And if you were closing your fridge door, I repeat, the government is not closing on Petrotrain. That from the Honorable Prime Minister. And shortly thereafter, all, 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 closed on all, all, all. They never presented a single report, a single expert reason or proper rationale. Yet with a stroke of a pen, they put tens of thousands on the breadline. They destroyed the fence line communities. They remove our fuel and forex security and weaken our energy sector. For the last year, we have heard not a single plan about the reopening of this refinery, but before election, Mama Guy, fooling people, going to sell it to OWTU. Election come and gone, what's happening now? Not a word, maybe the new Minister of Energy will tell us what's the plan for Petrin, the refinery down, what was Petrin refinery? They have abandoned the refinery to become scrap metal. Now with this budget, we're hearing rumors again, oh, oh, we're getting a buyer, we're going to sell it. That is old talk. The Petrotrin buying scrap iron. But any scrap iron dealers are asking to be able to, to buy the scrap iron. The Petrotrin closer is just a confirmation that nothing this government says can be trusted. <coughs> I turn now to agriculture, very, very important sector with respect to um, having food security for our country. This sector continues to receive total neglect by this royally led government. The impudence of the Minister of Finance is truly remarkable as he once again presented pie-in-the-sky promises to farmers. I will just deal with a few of the matters on this portfolio and our shadow person will pick it up. One of the matters that continues to be of most pressing challenge fa facing, the farmers are facing has to do with land tenure. Yet nothing has been done to alleviate these problems. This government seems incapable of understanding the problems regarding ownership of land. $20 million has been allocated in the budget to develop lands of Carony, at Carony and Orange Grove by the EMBD. No money has been allocated under this Ministry for Development of Agricultural Lands in other parts of the country, so it's at Orange Grove, at Kearney. The Minister's Access Road Repair Program to cover 80 kilometers of, kilometers of road 
excluded the entire south and central part of the country. These are major agricultural areas. This is, again, geographic discrimination, <clears throat> geographic apartheid. The Agricultural Incentives Program has been decreased by $12.1 million. Because of this neglect, farmers and citizens are the ones left to suffer. So imagine you invest as a farmer heavily with little or no assistance from government. You prepare your land, you plant your land, you maintain your crops, and then what happens? They all washed away in a flood due to the government's incompetence. And then to be sold dreams of receiving compensation never materializes when all these things are washed away. We look at the flooding and draining issues. <clears throat> it is alarming that the Minister of Finance did not mention flooding at least once in his presentation, because flooding is a threat year after year. In recent times, this flooding has expanded into areas that traditionally never flooded. And so we were alligators in the murky lagoon. That's where the flooding was, one minister said. Well, now the flooding is across the island, throughout the land. In fiscal 2021, only $2.8 million was spent to upgrade existing drainage pumps and gate inventory. No wonder we have such massive flooding in agricultural areas throughout the country. In fiscal 21, Ministry of Works and Transport, listen to this, you know, allocated $51 million under the DP, DP program for flooding and immigration. Out of that enormous spend, $29.5 million was spent. Where the other half gone? What did you do with it? And all the flooding continuing. While the government's new mantra is to blame climate change for flooding, it is really their neglect that results in this catastrophe. For agriculture, still on agriculture, pretty larceny. My office has received complaints from farmers all over the country of the lack of resources available for the pretty larceny squad to carry out their duties effectively. The major underlying issue is that of enforcement, as the squad lacks sufficient staff, trained personnel, equipment, and resources. In 2021, one would think that technology such as drones would be utilized to provide surveillance. However, we are told that some of the units do not even have functional vehicles or something as simple as a battery for the patrol vessel to carry out their function. And all the ministers spend so much time on create, Prime Minister's created a new ministry talking about digitization. The people don't even have a battery to put in the, in the car, in the vehicle, to do their job. I remember the hypocrisy of this government, you know. When community activists in Ahokata initiated a program called Project Hope in an effort to boost agriculture in the community, to get more young persons involved, it was met with immediate disdain from none other than the Prime Minister himself. You know what he called it? He called the program Pak Choi Politics. Well, people eat that, you know, Prime Minister. People do eat it. Senator Jirinjan and a team in La Hokata developed grow box systems, which successfully attracted dozens of youth from the community. thereby giving them an opportunity to make an honest livelihood and provide food for their families. That was criticized by the Prime Minister. You know, the Prime Minister really lacks, or kind of seem to understand about agriculture, because once again, we see in this budget presentation, the lack of foresight of how to boost um, the agricultural sector. And you recall when the Prime Minister told this country, we can't do agriculture, we don't have enough land. Didn't know the technology, no. You could roll food in water. You could do vertical, go up in the air. I have some of those in my yard. Vertical farming with Karaili vines, yes, and same, the vines, cucumbers and so on. Vertical, go up in the air. If you don't have space on the ground, you go vertical. So no understanding of agriculture, or the importance of food security for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I will speak now a bit on the health sector, madam. This government boasted about being number one in the world, the best in the Commonwealth for health, and yet they choose to go abroad to get treatment. It's hard to believe six years ago this nation was on the brink of establishing a vibrant health tourism sector with the Coover Children's Hospital. 
Imagine it took a global pandemic for this government to open the doors to that fully equipped Kufa Children's Hospital. I know we invested very heavily in health. We invested heavily in that hospital, specifically for children, with intentions of it becoming a flagship facility, encouraging and boosting medical tourism. This would have been a pilot of a new and upcoming industry that had the potential to create thousands of new jobs, as well as boosting and diversifying our economy. Knowing that we had a fully equipped hospital and only needed to be staffed, it was purposely kept closed. And I can only say that is political spite and malice. That shows you the kind of people we are dealing with here today. They have no issue with letting people die if it suits their political purposes. When we consider the pressures that the entire health sector is under on a normal day pre-COVID, it is alarming to note how little investment was made into bolstering the sector since then. Up to today, citizens have to wait months for a CT scan or an MRI. They have sat back and refused to open hospitals, as I said, of bad mind. Yet they're coming now to parade up and down, opening facilities that we started that took you years to build and finish. Some of these are Point Fourteen Hospital. Don't forget the Scarborough Hospital, man. Don't forget that. Completed under my government. Scarborough Hospital. We take ownership of it. The Rima Hospital. The Kuva Children's Hospital. The numerous health centers across the country that we refurbished and upgraded. Because of their bad mind, it seems, towards the population, they failed to utilize all the in infrastructure we left behind, thereby weakening our already burdened health system. They allowed it to sit and rot instead of utilizing them for the good health of people. So many are of the opinion that our health sector was purposely sabotaged by this government. All the PNM have built were some tents that they got donated from the US military. That's all they built. Imagine that some tents are the most that they built, they built after spending over 15 million in six years. So we were at a severe disadvantage because of bad mine, I see. They must admit it, did they sabotage our health system after the election? If nothing else, COVID has shown us the deplorable state of our health sector. It was bad before, and we all knew this, but COVID forced the world to see what incompetence we have to deal with here. And then they were using a fake report to say we were number one in the world. Fake report, you all remember that? Fake report to say we were number one in the world. The people who did that report literally put a disclaimer saying that this report was not to be used as a gauge of nation's policy effectiveness. But this government used it regardless because the truth is something so distant for them. So where did the money go? Look at the millions we got from the World Bank to fight the pandemic. This is a recent quote from the World Bank, dated July 8, 2020. The World Bank approved US 20 million for the Trinidad and Tobago COVID-19 emergency response project to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and strengthen national systems for public health preparedness. I asked today, where did that money go? What was it spent on? More wasting of every single dollar they get. Then we have a Minister of Health who went on a comedy show for everyone to laugh at him and he thinks some big TV star, some big Sawati. The health sector was doomed the minute they placed a bush doctor like the Al Singh to head such a ministry. With education, there is so much wrong with how this government has treated the children of our beloved nation. I make no apologies for saying that our nation's children have always been close to my heart. Anyone who knows me knows that, and that is why it breaks my heart to see how this government treats with our children and our educators. For yet another year, education and training has been promised the largest allocation in the budget, with a budgeted expenditure of $6.9 billion for fiscal 2022. 
Last year, the budgeted figure was 7.97 billion, and in the year previous, 2019, 7.5 billion. So always the largest allocations. In fact, if the minister had actually spent what was allocated, or if they had been dispersed to that ministry, to this crucial se sector, then over the six-year period they've been in government, education would have been benefiting from government investment of $47.2 billion. That would have been invested in the children of our nation. Do you know what that works out to be? That works out to be more than 134,000 per child of school age. For that kind of money, our children should have been sitting in first world education facilities, learning in an, in an interactive IT-supported e-learning environment, textbooks on their laptops, <clears throat> attending classes in upgraded schools with the best facilities and well-trained teaching and support staff. Children would have been able to choose from a wide variety of career paths and access certified education, comparable with the best that the rest of the world has to offer. But wait, that was my vision. That is what we were working towards. The PNM version is what we are stuck with today after six years. It breaks my heart to see schools paid for by taxpayers left to rot, overgrown with bushes, inhabited by snakes and rats and vermin and vandals because of the bad mind of this government. In my own constituency every day, I get complaints from parents that the government has refused to complete the Shiva Boys College and the Parvati Girls College. They were both almost completed five years, six years ago. They were almost completed. The government has refused to complete those schools. Why are you suffering the children? Why are you suffering the children? Throughout the country, thousands of children continue to struggle to use their parents' cell phone to get onto the online classes. Thousands more simply have no access to devices. They have to depend on photocopied work. So you can imagine my shock to discover that last year, while our children suffered, the Minister of Education did not spend $4.7 million allocated for the purpose of acquiring and distributing laptops and tablets. Did not spend it. And when I checked the prices, you know how much laptops and devices you could have bought? That could have bought almost 10,000 devices. 10,000 devices. We were told that there are over 60,000 children still with our devices. Why do you hate our children? Why do you suffer them that way? There were 79,000 children in the school feeding program before COVID. The ministry and this government knew that these children were living in difficult circumstances. That's why they were in the school feeding program in the first place. And it's been made worse because many of their parents have lost their jobs. How did the government reach out to ensure that these children were able to receive at least one meal a day? At least one meal a day? You have condemned a generation of children to no sustainable future. Coming to the end. The Rowley PNM government's housing policy, I turn to housing, has been nothing short of atrocious. The policy confusion has been acute. The lack of implementation is pathetic. And the suffering of the most vulnerable, distressing. But as we say, elections have consequences. And there will be no end in sight to the misery faced by the poor and deserving citizens in desperate need of shelter. The obscene realization that this government will do nothing except promise pie in the sky projects came at page 76 when after tedious repetition of the same old projects, the Minister of Finance dropped his voice and slumped lower to whisper Madam Speaker, the upcoming demand for funding requirements will far exceed our ability to meet the required demand. That's the minister admitting, I don't know. That they, can't, they wouldn't be able to meet the demand. They wouldn't be able to perform. What he meant to say was, we have no money, so nothing will happen. That's what that means. 
the manifest abandonment of the construction sector, the engine of any economic revitalization strategy could be found in the details. When we look at the IDF, Infrastructure Development Fund, <clears throat> 228 of that program in the estimates, we confront a hypocrisy and deception when it comes to housing. Unbelievable. They have, they have budgeted zero dollars for the accelerated housing project. They have budgeted zero dollars for the accelerated housing project. I wonder what the Minister of Housing has to say about this. Why are you all treating the girl like that? Why have you given her some money to build some houses? Have you built any houses since you came into office? In the six years you've been there? A misnomer, if ever there was one. Accelerated housing program. Zero dollars allocated. They budget zero dollars for that program. How can you build one single home when you budget not a cent for this accelerated housing program? This is proof of hypocrisy and deception by this government. They shamefully talk about home construction while they budget zero dollars to build houses. The Ministry of Housing is being run like a parlor. There's nothing under the ministry as if, what a, if, as if it was a plan to ensure that the minister was their only name. The public-private partnerships are administered under the Ministry of Finance, and the 25 million allocated under the Ministry for Finance last year for this purpose was only 5 million. And you come back again with more private-public partnerships, you have put only $5 million in your allocation. What do you expect? Any different results? I turn to public utilities, madam. And this ministry is so vital because everybody, or the majority of people, use electricity, and almost everyone uses water. Everyone uses water. Government has boldly signaled that utility rates will be increased in the near future. At a recent meeting of the JSC on land and physical infrastructure, the acting CEO of WASA stated that property tax will drive water rates up because water rates are calculated at annual taxable value. So property tax is going to send your water rates up. That is said by the CEO of WASA. TNTEC and the Ministry of Energy, through the Cabinet Subcommittee on Energy, have completed the negotiations. So, what's going to happen there? These prices are expected to go up, and TNTEC is already indebted to NGC to the tune of $4 billion. So, you're going to get property tax going up on you. You go in and get WASA rates on you. You go in and get TNTEC rates on you. That's a triple whammy. That's a triple blow to people who are already suffering already under stress and under pressure. So, the, the bottom line is that despite the harsh economic climate, the suffering, the poverty rates, this will bring greater poverty and more suffering. In light of all this, many consumers pay water rates and receive a very poor supply of water. Under my administration, over 75% of the country had a regular water supply. <clears throat> Today, there are protests, bucket brigades, and dry taps. By the minister's own admission in the budget statement, page 111, several projects were completed in the last financial year to bring about a greater supply of water to beneficiaries. Now, I am very happy. Um, for the errors the minister listed for those projects um, having been completed. And out of all those, only one of these was in an opposition constituency. Only one. 99% of the projects by the minister identified were all held in PNM constituencies. Again, it's this geographical apartheid, geographical discrimination. Is the minister and his government saying that the people of Diego Martin and Point 14 are more equal than the people of my own constituents in Separia? Are they more equal, less equal? The government continues, my constituents, they have had no water for weeks in certain areas of my constituency. Government continues to carry their politics of spite, malice, and geographic discrimination.
Instead of increasing the capacity of Vasa's infrastructure, we have, wow, <laughs> thank you. We have, uh, my colleague is just showing me how much time I have left. And uh, Madam, as I told you, I did not intend to make any long, boring speech. So I think we'll all be very happy to hear <laughs> that I'm coming to the end of my contribution. So, instead of increasing WASA's capacity, we have been over 100 million in cuts to materials and supplies. Government does not have the political will to fix the problems at WASA. As these cuts, are these cuts a part of a plan to further emasculate and demonize WASA? Contract employment at WASA has now been cut by over 230, 232 million dollars under the line item in the estimates of uh, of um, in the estimates of expenditure, recurrent expenditure. Is this another part of the plan to drive Wasa into the ground, and then for government to come in as a savior? We have seen this playbook at Petrotrin. While the Minister of Finance regaled us about Wasa completing its transformational plan. The minister told us nothing, not one project, a mark to address the crisis affecting several constituencies across the country because of aging infrastructure and leakages. On the fiscal measures, the Minister of Finance announced the increase of rebates from 25% to 35% for customers whose bills are $300 inclusive of that or less. He said that about 210,000 households will benefit. But these repairs are an attempt to appear as though government has compassion for the poor and downtrodden. In reality, they are giving with one hand and taking with the next hand. <coughs> because when the rates are revised, how many of these households will now have a bill over $300? and therefore not entitled to any rebate. So give with one hand, take with the other hand. Left hand, right hand. When the rates are revised, regarding impending review to the tariffs, to which this will have a severe impact on persons currently receiving rebates, because many of them are now come to fall over the $300 bucket based on the new prices. The minister knows this, and therefore, I know he used to tell me this from time to time when I'm in the parliament in the past. He's playing smart with foolishness. That's what he's doing. On pages 160 and 161 of the statement, Minister indicated that cash card program would be administered by the Ministry of Public Utilities. That's a strange thing, you know. Is this going to be like another PNM slush fund where PNM supporters receive the majority of cards? like what they do with other resources of the state? What will be the criteria to access these utility cash cards and fuel cards? Would it be a PNM party card, as we saw in the past? And why on earth did the minister not provide a timeline for the introduction of these cards? And why on earth is the Minister of Public Utilities heading a fuel cash card? How come utilities is giving out a fuel cash card? That should have been, I think, the minister, the new minister of energy. Fuel cash card, how is it going through the minister? Why? Is that a typo as well? I can't say. The RSC is at its final stage of determining water and electricity rates. This requires public consultations. However, when you look at the estimates, there is no allocation for the hosting of any public consultations. No allocations whatsoever under that line item. There is nothing, zero. So how are they going to hold these public consultations? Or is that they will come up with their determinations in secret? Um, how? By the phone? By Zoom? How is it going to be done? Because there is no money allocated for this line item, none. I turn now to this very important ministry, the new ministry. This ministry was created this year, 2021, last year, last year, 2020. Digital transformation, ministry created last year. That involves the integration of digital technology in all areas of operations. 
This is one area that there were a lot of expectations and hope that could have provided a sustainable avenue for job creation, business development, and the creation of new technologies. Instead, the Minister of Finance was short on timelines, plans, roadmaps, and details. Instead, several of the Minister's grandiose announcements will repeat projects closed under the guise of different names with remodeled descriptions. The Minister of Finance stood with a straight face, as we say, um, in local parlance, we would say, <clears throat> and he hit the copy and paste button when he reached this particular ministry. I want to ask the minister, if this government is serious about ICTs, why then did the 20 million allocated for implementation of ICT plan in the last fiscal year only see $995,000 spent? 20 million allocated because it's such a vital sector, especially in this pandemic time, the ICT sector. Why is it you only spent $995,560 when you had an allocation of 20 million? Why? Why? Has the plan been shelved? Has the plan collapsed? Or like everything else, PNM promises never materialize. Government has touted e-legislative agenda to support electronic transactions. And the minister was brass, brass face enough to raise this in his contribution. This is coming from a government who passed regulations for being fined for not wearing a mask in 2020. And in 2021, there was no way, no medium to make these payments for the persons to pay the fines. I think, again, not making any sense. Page 13 of last year's budget presentation mirrored similar announcements made by the minister in that year's budget. The minister last year spoke about an electronic window for business operations and government services. This year, we have another repeated promise of harmonizing all government services with very little results from last year to this year. Minister in his presentation spoke about the ease of doing business index being compromised. However, if we were to use the minister's own words on page 29 of his last budget <clears throat> under diversification, the minister admits, then he admitted, it takes 10 days to start a business, 254 days for receiving construction permits, 61 days to obtain electricity, 77 days to register property, 65 days to obtain credit, three and a half years to enforce a contract, two and a half years to result in solvency. And then the Minister of Trade came here and boasted about a host of things that were going to be done to improve our ease of doing business. Well, which one of this has changed? What has changed? We all know that when you sell a car in 2016, it takes you up to 2021 and still not registered, still not transferred. <coughs> Still not transferred. So, what has changed with the ease of doing business? And you know what I find is the most hilarious? The most hilarious. This brand new ministry of digitization. Digitization. Do you know? They do not even have a website. They do not have a website. And you in charge of, <laughs> of this drive? How can that be? You don't have a website. It, it is, it, you know, if it, as they say, if you don't laugh, you'll, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. It is ludicrous. It is ludicrous. You don't have a website in this ministry. So we were trying to find out um, where is the address of this ministry? And that's how we went up on the website. We were, I, said, I told her, one of my staff, I said, check the website. It is still listed under the Ministry of Public Admin and Digitization. So it's just a word, a fancy buzzword once more. I, I turn out to Tobago. There is nothing in the budget to sustain Tobago. For a man who touts Tobago heritage, this Prime Minister has consistently treated the people of Tobago 
with nothing but contempt. How can we ever forget the hell he put people through when he and his Minister of Works and Transport, Transport infamously crashed the inter-island ferry service? We cannot forgive him for the notorious Sandals scandal. When this government wanted to get their hands on the assets from Clico, like no man's land, so they could sell it to Sandals, the, governor, the um, sitting central bank governor turned a blind eye to his statutory and fiduciary obligations to Clico policyholders. Today, the Sandals deal has collapsed, but no one in this land knows what has happened to no man's land. No one knows what has happened to no man's land. Remember, it is no man's land. What has happened? You remember it was transferred out of the purview of the Central Bank under this government. In breach of the Central Bank Act, it was transferred to the office of the Prime Minister and for sandals. Boko Reef, I think it was called. There was a company. Now we have no sandals, we have no shoes, we have no slippers, and now we have no man's land. Where has it gone? All citizens, especially the people of Tobago, deserve to know from this Prime Minister what happened to this $100 million asset which was last vested under the Prime Minister's portfolio. The last we knew, no man's land was in Golden Grove Boko Company Limited. And that company has been defunct. They last filed their annual returns to the company's registry two years ago. So where is this land? In whom is it vested? Is it vested in a company that has failed to file its annual returns with the company's registry? The Prime Minister displayed contempt for the people of Tobago by his disregard of the will of the electorate in the January 21 TH election. Existing law to break the deadlock but the Rowley-led government instructed the EBC via unnecessary amendments to the law <clears throat> to change the law. Madam that is Speaker, evidence Ma Madam Speaker, of the... 53 e please. The opposition leaders assured us it's not going to be much longer. Please, let's hear the opposition leader. Continue, Madam. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much. So there was existing law to break the deadlock. Instead, they went in their quest for self governed They went um, in defiance of that ele election and the existing law to come to this house to change the law, to create these 15 seats. And contrary to what somebody in Tobago say about it, do have nobody living on the ridge, nobody living there. Well, I think a, a constituent from that area, one of the seats, has indeed filed a, a matter in the court uh, before they or is in the process of filing a matter before the court. So that was just total nonsense about on the ridge that the met people, Baratara San Juan, didn't know that no one was living there when there are thousands of people living in that particular area. So we're not buying that. We're not buying that. We are not buying that. We let the court decide. And you know, what is surprising, what is surprising... But let's get on with it, please. Thank you. You know, Miss, what is surprising now, that some view those amendments as a quest by the government to really gerrymander the seats and deny the will of the people of Tobago. They have now named the date for the THA election. This is the second election in one year. And it's ironic, given that the Debe South Electoral District in the Penal Debe Regional Corporation has been vacant for seven months now. Seven months. Two elections in Tobago in one year, none for Debe South. After seven months, they have no elected representative. Yesterday, I wrote a pre-action protocol letter to the Attorney General asking why no date has been set and calling for uh, the issuance of a writ of election. So I await a reply. So you can't say it have, you have COVID, so you can't hold that um, PDRC election, 
but you're going to Tobago to hold a second election. So we sent you the pre-action letter and we await your response, um, Mr. Attorney General. I can't leave Tobago without talking about the hotels. You know, you know, the government is promising all these pie in the sky projects to bamboozle voters, perhaps. Among this regime's most recent exhibitions of disdain for Tobago is a plan for a $500 million Marriott Hotel in Rocky Point. People cannot get food. People are not traveling. The hotels are empty, even the existing ones. You want to build five hotels? Not one, you know. Five hotels this government wants to build. <laughs> Nation of Bell Boys. People cannot get food, as I say. Five hotels. Hotels for whom? The Prime Minister built a multi million dollar home for himself in Tobago, paid for by taxpayers' dollars. Now they want to build multi million dollar hotels. And this time, you're constructing a hotel at the height of a global pandemic where international travel is already severely curtailed. So who's going to come and stay at these five hotels? Instead of assisting local hoteliers and guest house owners who are lamenting the loss of income due to the ongoing closure of beaches and lack of airlift, government is bringing in competition. What are the government's plan for Tobago? Just build some hotels or build a zip line? What are your plans? Build a zip line. Where is the zip line? Not built yet. And same way these hotels will come crashing down, just like the Sandler scandal, because you're granting incentives and so on, these will come crashing down too. And there will be none of these uh, fancy things that you're promising now in an election season. We in the UNC have always respected our sister Isle as an equal partner in development. And we have trusted and supported the people of Tobago in regulating their affairs without interference from Trinidad. Under the government I led, I am proud to say Tobago saw unprecedented growth and prosperity. And our shadow, person shadowing our Tobago matters, will go into more details about those. So ma'am, I come now. I have spent some time in, in deviling down into the budget statement. And I would like to say, that's not all I would like to do. I would like to share some of our plans to rebuild and restore Trinidad and Tobago. It is clear that our country is in a deep crisis. It is also clear that this government does not have a clue how to manage the economy or lead us out of the abyss into which they have sunk us. As we have done in the past, the United National Congress can and will rescue our nation. This is not just old talk. We have a record of growing the economy, generating revenue, and creating jobs. Today, as always, we stand ready with a plan to rebuild our economy and restore stability. We did it before, and we are ready to get the job done again. Unlike this government, whose only idea is to tax, 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 borrow, 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 and spend, 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 we have practical solutions for revenue generation and job creation. Our strategy for recovery, sustainable growth, and diversification of TNT's economy is built on five interconnected principles. And I've noticed recently the Minister of Finance has stolen this from us. Well, not stolen, plagiarized this from us. Principle one. People-centered development. Getting people back to work. Principle two, pro-business. Allow the private sector to drive growth and development. Principle three, deepen economic reforms, but with a human face. Principle four, principle four, local content. Give people a sense of ownership and independence. <coughs> Principle five, sustainability, promoting environmental stewardship. The UNC's National Economic Transformation Master Plan, I'll share some of that with you. <coughs> the UNC has spoken to the people. We've consulted people. 
We have consulted with experts and professionals, and we have developed what we believe is a solid and sustainable national economic transformation master plan to rescue and restore TNT. The new UNC master plan lays out, lays out a comprehensive suite of policy initiatives and programs to steer the economy towards a more sustainable development path. Our plan will create 50,000 new jobs. We did it before without a new tax, and we will do it again. We will focus heavily on diversification and new business development so that people and country alike can benefit. Let's look at some of our prosperity engines, which is really aimed at diversification to grow more revenue streams and to um, create forex and to create jobs. <clears throat> the most pressing issue of diversification, those opposite have spent their time doing nothing but talking. Indeed, over the last five years, the Prime Minister has displayed irritation and annoyance when confronted with the need to diversify the economy and develop new revenue streams. We must look elsewhere for economic sustainability. Now more than ever, with the collapsed economy, we must focus on new revenue streams and not just taxes. Taxes and bonds have been the only source of revenue for this government, apart from reading the HSF that will be built up. We have identified several prosperity engines to create new jobs, transform our economy, and create more revenue. Bretchen Castle Agro Processing Complex, a sugar manufacturing facility, an east-west corridor, biotechnology manufacturing corridor, Sevilla Digital Innovation Park, Tamana Solar Tech Renewable Energy, West Port of Spain Trini Creative Arts Street and Area, East Port of Spain Steel Pan Manufacturing Facility. And you know, I have mentioned this before, and a member for Laventil. Uh, Minister Hines got up and said, no, we have that already. We have that already. What we have is a very um, small private enterprise. We are talking about uh, East Port of Spain steel pan manufacturing facility. I mean, look at this. We are the inventors of the only, what do you call it, percussion instrument uh, in whichever century. 21st century, and we had to buy steel pan from other people, but we should be exporting steel pan all over the world. This is ours, it is homegrown, it is indigenous, we are proud of it, we should be selling these pans. And that was what that, that was about. We'll talk about a Piaco Aircraft Maintenance Repair and Operations Hub. Piaco Aircraft Maintenance Repair and Operations Hub, again, to create jobs, to bring in more revenue to grow the economy. That's what these are for. A Cedrus Maruga Southwest Peninsula Economic Zone. Point Galeota Energy Logistics Hub. Plymouth International Cruise Ship Marina, Marina Complex. Making Tobago a duty-free zone. Port of Spain, port revitalization. Not leasing away the port and giving it away to your friends and financiers and family. That's not what that was. That's not what that is. These pro prosperity engines will mobilize and engage the private sector, both local and international. And their implementation will have larger positive multiplier effects in kickstarting the economic recovery, fostering growth, and supporting transformation. What is needed is a government and a leader and leaders who will put their shoulders to the wheel, a government that will see the private sector and stakeholders as partners in the process of development. I am confident in the will and ability of our people to adapt to these challenges and to seize opportunities as we have demonstrated in the past. As I wrap up my contribution, <clears throat> I again reiterate that this budget is a declaration of war on the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. 
Madam Speaker, if you permit me, I would like to congratulate our sister CARICOM nation and the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, for the position she has assumed at the United Nations. So as I say, this budget is a declaration of war on the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. But this is a war that the PNM the Rowley led government will lose because the people of Trinidad and Tobago have declared war on the PNM. Our nation will fight back against this government. We in the opposition will hold every single one of you to account. None of you will escape. I think people in our land, they're singing the song and have the, have the words saying, don't mistake our kindness for weakness. Those who perpetrate plans against the people of TNT to dehumanize us, to impoverish children, to tax upon tax for persons without jobs, those who sit in high towers whilst all around them our people are begging for food, I say your days are numbered. In Trinidad and Tobago, democracy and justice will always prevail against the forces of oppression. When you sit in a cabinet which makes decisions to punish the very people who put you there, you have broken the essential social contract to do all that can be done to make our country a better place. You have turned your backs on the vulnerable. You are abusing our children by not providing proper tools for education. You are destroy destroying jobs and livelihoods, and you continue to support something which you may not understand is much bigger than yourselves. That this rowdy led government is slashing and burning our beloved country to the ground. And a few amongst you are funneling the money, monies from the treasury through renters and brothers' banks and rental properties and wives' legal briefs and so on. The public does not support you. They will, have their, they will have their day and they will have their say. I say to the good people of Trinidad and Tobago, never be disheartened. What is done in the darkness will come to light and we are seeing it. We are seeing indemnity agreements popping up in the public domain. We are seeing car transfers popping up. All kinds of things are just popping up. What is done in the darkness will come to light. It will come to the light. And when I say we will fight you and we declare on war on you today, I say we declare war on you today, I am talking about political war. I am not inciting any whatever, whatever. It's not sedition. I'm talking about political war. As I said, we will fight you in the parliament. We will fight you outside the parliament. We will fight you on the pavement and everywhere that we can, legally and constitutionally, we will do that. I say it will not be the first time that when a PNM government falls, the UNC has to come and fix the country. We have done so in the past, and we are ready now again. The UNC will restore and rebuild our nation. Madam Speaker, I wish to share with you that I wear pink today in recognition of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and I urge others to be so aware to support that recognition. I want to thank you all and thank the honorable members of this house for affording me the opportunity to speak here today. Thank you very much. Honourable Members, this house is now suspended and shall resume at 1.20 p.m. <laughs>